honoured to be asked to put a talk to you uh, together for you today. And um, what was particularly lovely, Katrina mentioned that I have been making the, the, a couple of series now of um, Raiders of the Lost Past, which has, of course, taken me outside the comfort zone of my specialism, which is really kind of late antiquity through to high medieval art. But um, I, I have been, as a lecturer, I have been doing that for many years and I have a curious mind and I love making big connections across time and space and making the, these, these two series over the last four years has been so illuminating for me. I am not there as the expert. I am there as the enthusiast. I am there as the person that wants to make connections. And so I have been able to study the Olmecs in Mexico. Um, as I mentioned, I've just been doing the ancient Egyptians, but also uh, the Lion Man, which, which goes back tens of thousands of years. And, and one of the journeys I had was to Knossos. And in each of these programs, what we try and do across an hour is quite complicated because not only do we tell you the story of the ancient civilization, we then tell you the story of its discovery, usually by a singular male archaeologist in the last 100, 150 years. We tell the story of how of what that discovery meant at the time. And then we weave a third strand in, which is what's happened since and how has scholarship and approach, how have approaches developed since that discovery. And it's in that spirit that I offer up this lecture to you today, because I had dreamt of going to Knossos my whole life. I couldn't quite believe there's actually a moment caught on film where I'm kind of pinching myself going, goodness, I'm standing here alone at 8 a.m. with only a drone above me. And I, you know, I've, I'm realizing a dream after decades. And this was possibly one of the most wonderful programs I've ever made because of the location, because of the civilization and the stories I was uncovering. But for me, it was because of the art. I had heard of Minoan art, I had seen examples of it, but it wasn't until I was stood there in Heraklion Museum, overwhelmed by cabinet after cabinet of the most stunning art. And I think, as you'll see when I, I go through today, the things that really struck me is I always have moved towards the medieval and away from the classical, partly because of my tastes in art, I think. I do like figural and highly naturalistic and representational art, and narrative art, but I think I also love the abstract and the symbolic and the iconic. And what I found in Minoan art was this beautiful melding of the two. It really struck me as just the most vibrant, I think modern and exciting art that you can find from the past. So that was, the, that was the, the real highlight for me. But as I started to delve deeper into Minoan society, Minoan culture, Minoan religion, there were so many things that came to the fore and one of them was women. You can see from my holding slide, the blue ladies, um, just so beautiful, but, so important too. And that is why I think I really tapped in at that particular moment, because I was working on both of these books. And now Katrina very kindly said that my book seminar is out in March. Unfortunately, it's not out till July, but I have another book that I worked on from the beginning of lockdown right up until this year, which is out next week. And it is this book, Goddess. And in the same way that Raiders has encouraged me to look at so many different um, civilizations, cultures across the world, this book pushed me even harder. I think it was the hardest thing I've, I've written because I had to condense months of scholarship on reading on each of these goddesses, spirits, saints from parts of the world I'd never even researched before taking all that knowledge, condensing it into storytelling, and then having it scrutinized by a body of 50 experts from the British Museum for accuracy. <laughs> so it is painstakingly, lovingly put together, but it is also a beautiful book. The illustrator, Sarah Walsh, is a genius. And I just, I'm so proud to have made this book. But Feminar is my big tome. This is the one I have been sat on for five, six years now. I have been, crafting it, honing it, and I'm so, so pleased with the finished piece. It's provocative, it's going to shake up how we view the Middle Ages, but I also hope it 
it will empower women to find themselves in the past and to find examples going forward that can be uh, help shape the future. And that is also what I took away from my trip to Knossos because the more we see of ourselves in the past and the more we see that our, our emancipation, our, our rights are not just less than a hundred years old, they go back and they are manifested at different times in different places. I think that is important and valuable. So these books feed into this lecture. But um, as I mentioned, it was from this trip, which was in the summer of 2020. And I made three, I made this one, I made one on the Osberg ship, uh, the Viking ship burial, again, surprisingly, it had two female skeletons inside it. And, um, and I also discovered the world's oldest city in Chattelhuyak, which again was an absolute revelation. This was by far the most, um, pleasurable of the three shoots I think it was the summer and um, we were traveling under COVID I had had very severe COVID in the March which which I ended up in hospital with and I remember going out to Crete and saying to my mum I look horrible mummy I look tired and I look you know ill and I remember her saying to me listen Nina you are making a history documentary but you are a little slice of history too what you have been through and what your body has been through is part of a, a historical document so don't feel self-conscious just go out and make this program and I fell in love with Crete it's the first place I'm going to travel to with my family uh, when we all could do international travel again because it is just such an unusual such a beautiful such a a different place it's not like Greece it's not like the other islands it has its own identity its own sense of itself and I think all of that is tied to this pride in an ancient heritage that they know is unique to them but how do we get to the Minoans how do we access them well via their primary gatekeeper of course Sir Arthur Evans someone whose name I've known for a long time because I work very closely with the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and this is his portrait that hangs um, in one of the galleries surrounded by uh, both copies and um, original artifacts that he discovered through his time in Crete and um, this, of course, is his multi-volume write-up of his work over 30 years at Knossos, at the what he calls the Palace of Minos at Knossos. And so what we explored in the documentary was this idea that you have to understand Arthur Evans and the time in which he was making his discovery in order to understand what has happened to studies in uh, Minoan art and archaeology over the last hundred years and how we open up new doors going forward. But I, I want to start with him because that was the title of this lecture, the, the male lenses through which we've been uh, able to view Knossos over the past hundred years. Now, I wanna draw your attention to this image on the front of the volume. It's, I'll show you where it comes from in a moment. Some of you may recognize it, but to produce this imprint on the front really annoyed Arthur Evans publishers because it was expensive. It's, it's imprinted in gold and he insisted on this image appearing on the front cover of each of his volumes because to all intents and purposes, he made this symbol of this crown, the logo, if you like, for his version of Knossos. And where did he get it from? Well. He got it from this. This is a reconstructed piece of Minoan art known as the Prince of Lilies. And when he first discovered it in the, um, when he was doing his excavations, he makes this, oh, sorry, I've gone forward one. He makes this observation. Anatopical ob observation of this torso shows a, a contorted musculature and the left disappeared arm was surely and as in an ascendant position because the pectoral muscle is raised. These observations allow us to conclude the torso was one of a boxer, resembling the many athletic representations engraved on the boxer vase from Hagia Triada. The lily crown belongs to another personage, perhaps a priestess. The painted reliefs of, the two, of two athletes boxing in the palace of Knossos were surely the model of the bo uh, boxing children fresco in Acroteria um, in Thera. Now, why am I showing you this why am I giving this quote that he wrote back after discovering it well because he very quickly changed his mind 
He was actually right in these observations. This is a hybrid piece. The problem that Arthur Evans had when he was reconstructing frescoes from Knossos was that they were in a fragmentary condition. And it was putting a piece, a jigsaw puzzle together without any idea what the overall image was supposed to be. So his, his instincts were correct. The lower half of the leg, you can see there's one leg facing in one direction, while the arm faces in the other. It is most likely that this is a relief um, fresco of two boxes, uh, which again, we see he, he's given a couple of examples there, but there are other many other examples of men engaged in, in this sort of boxing stance. But he also notes that the headdress is probably that, that that's come from somewhere else, a priestess. What it's now thought is that headdress was actually from a griffin, similar to the ones we see in the throne room, which I've put an illustration of there. So when it's reconstructed like this, when he instructs for the pieces to be put together in this way, there is a reason for it. Arthur Evans is looking for King Minos. He writes home in his um, very early letters, and during the excavations, that he has discovered the palace of King Minos. And all he wants in that respect is to find visual evidence to support it. So he creates this hybrid because in, in this respect, he ends up with a poster boy, if you like, for the strong king that he's searching for. But as I will reveal in the course of this talk, that really doesn't seem to be um, a correct assumption about life within the Palace of Knossos at all. I will return to the throne room soon, but keep it in your minds. <laughs> we'll be coming back to it. Arthur Evans. So I think I make the point throughout the documentary that he was able to conduct his excavations uh, on the back of Schliemann's discoveries of Troy. He entered into this sort of archaeological arms race, if you like, with representatives from America, from Germany, from Holland, all across the ancient world, where um, funds were pumped into treasure seeking missions, if you like. And he is a wealthy young man. His family uh, had made their fortune through paper manufacturing, and he went to school at a young age to Harrow. He did experience sadness, trauma in his young life. He lost his mother when he was only eight years old. And then he became a boarder. And what was really interesting when I started to go back through the Arthur, Arthur Evans archives in the Ashmolean, is I was able to find this map. Now I've put the, his overall map and then a close up on it, but he made this map while he was a schoolboy at Harrow. I'm not exactly sure of the date, but he would have been in his teens. And firstly, it's beautiful and wonderful to hold something that he created all those over a century, well over a century ago. But he's focusing in on this area of Greece. And, uh, but then what is what he then goes on to do is, is show the Isle of Crete in more detail than anywhere else on the map. Now, at this point, he had no connection to Crete, but this teenage boy has listed all the major sites. And it, it made me think at the time, and I still think it today, that he was drawn to this place. Uh, he didn't, he, it wasn't inevitable he would end up there. He then after school became a journalist and, and was moving through the Bal uh, Balkans, but there was something pulling him to Crete. And after his time as a journalist, he of course ends up um, leading the Ashmolean collections. And a second sort of, I suppose, nugget, uh, tantalizing insight into what drew him to discover Knossos is also held again in the Ashmolean and it came into his possession while, while he was there. It is a seal, a seal die. And it's quite a simple one, but it was this seal die being uh, brought into the Ashmolean and him casting his eye over it. He remembered others that he had seen. And he started to think if this, if these sorts of objects could be made that don't seem to be coming out of Greece, they, they, they seem distinct, they seem different, they have different images on them. Then if there is a civilization capable of creating something like this, where would it be found? Where would we look for it? And that is why he ultimately ends up taking his entire fortune, his family's fortune, and plunging it all into this um, wild dig at Knossos. That it, it was so fast, he would pay each of the diggers to hit solid 
ground. If they could get to solid stone first, they would get a payment. And so they were working so fast, which of course we now know in, in retrospect, that's destructive or think of all the layers of history that he and his team annihilated in the process of getting to, to the stone of Knossos Palace. Uh, but that was the nature of archeology span at the time. I think you get a sense of what he was after from this quote. He wrote again a letter home and he said, I am determined on the archeological conquest of this island. I think that's quite a, Disturbing and powerful quote, really, because this is 1900 when he's excavating Knossos. It is a, a, at a point where colonialism is rife, where, as I mentioned, there is this race from um, Western and, and European countries to find the treasures, to take um, custody of the culture and history of other nations. So as I mentioned, I've just got back from Egypt and this is a story that repeats itself there. It's interesting with Carter because he was digging, he was doing his work 20 years later and it's amazing the difference a couple of decades made. Uh, it was ultimately um, still a smash and grab sort of archeology, span but the treasures remained in Egypt. They were, were kept and that's I think important. But when it comes to what Arthur Evans did, he, he was the overseer and the owner of the land. And so he had complete control of this dig. But part of the story I think we need to understand is he has written out the contributions of people from Crete in the discovery of Knossos. This is often the case, I've discovered this on, on most of the, the programs I've done, about archeological digs at the turn of the century is you would not acknowledge the Egyptian foreman who happened to find the stairs down to Tutankhamun's tomb. You would not acknowledge the Turkish team who knew there was a mound that uh, stones were starting to appear from the, from the sand. It's, it's quite a modern phenomenon and it's still not done enough for um, archeological teams to be made up of people from the country with the expertise in their area. It's still a worry, it still worries me now. And the person pictured here, his bust actually now, I think quite poignantly, stands alongside Arthur Evans's at Knossos. And this is Minos Calacarinos. And he actually discovered Knossos 20 years before Arthur Evans. It is because of the finds that Minos made that Arthur Evans knew he should look in that area. He found coins with images of the labyrinth on, as you can see here. Um, and he found 12 of these enormous pithoi. These are storage jars. They're huge, some of them. I, I actually wanted to include a to scale one of a little me next to it, enormous pithoi. But he, Minos knew that there was something important on this site and he excavated carefully. So when it came to his multi-volume write-up of his dig at Knossos, Arthur Evans only mentions Minos once, and he says he does it in a derogatory tone. He says that um, some digging had been done on the site previously, but that it had been destructive and poorly executed. So he condemns there's these earlier digs, but. Uh, I've looked at Minos's um, paperwork. This is some a couple of samples of it here. He was pretty meticulous considering he was digging in the 1880s. He was very careful to record what he found where, to give measurements, to include diagrams, complete records of all the digs he did. So it is not fair to say that he was um, being destructive and, and not careful about his work. So we have to thank Arthur Evans for finding Knossos, for pouring his fortune into the discovery. But we also have to remember he was working in his time. He was a product of empire and he wanted to see the things he recognized reflected back at him. We'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Um, one of the biggest, I suppose, <sighs> both triumphs and criticisms that could be leveled against Arthur Evans is how he turned the site at Knossos into an archeological Disneyland. That's uh, what one of the archeologists described it as to me and I like it. <laughs> um, if anybody has visited Knossos, but if you've also been to like um, Paliastros or you've been to any of the other 
ruinous sites on Crete, you'll see the difference. There are amazing, extensive, beautiful ruins that you can walk through, but they are precisely that, they are ruins. They, from the moment they were excavated, they've been left open to the elements and they've deteriorated and they haven't had reconstruction work done. And so getting a sense of what the original would have looked like can sometimes be difficult. What Arthur Evans did, he had to come up with some sort of conservation, because, as I mentioned, if the stones he'd uncovered had just been left, then they would be pretty much destroyed. But he also wanted to, I suppose, sell an idea of Knossos to the world. And so he set about these concrete restorations that have become so iconic. You'll see there a... Uh, postage stamp, stamp that was released. And what is the iconic image of Knossos? It is this, the bull freeze. And this is of course on the, the Northern entrance. What I was shocked to discover was that virtually nothing here is original. Now, parts of the bull freeze were discovered in this location. They were broken up and they may have been somewhere near here. But all of the columns, that, that pedestal, everything, and particularly the color, all of that built up work that creates this platform, that is all the work of 1920s and um, Arthur Evans. And I sort of worry about that because again, it's a misrepresentation of this culture, but it has of course encouraged so many visitors, so many other people to delve deeper into the subject in a way that they might not have done otherwise. But this disnification, if I use that term again, uh, continues across the site, uh, even down to the names. So you see myself and Sandy McGilfrey, who was the archeologist that accompanied me for quite a lot of my time in Crete, an amazing, fantastic man. He uh, has taken me here into what's known as the King's Megaron, and there's a Queen's one too. And what you can see again are these sort of art deco, lushly coloured concrete pillars. I have to admit, walking in and going, ooh, I like that. That's my taste. <laughs> but it is the taste of 1920s, 1930s um, European style. It is not a faithful representation of what the original would have looked like. Indeed, as you go inside, you see other columns, brightly coloured, and a reconstructed mural. Now, this is not to say that the dolphin mural would not have hung there, or that it would not have looked like that. But again, remember, Arthur Evans is reconstructing it from bits of the jigsaw puzzle. So it's an imagined reconstruction. And this extends to his interpretation of the whole site, really. He wanted to see this as a palace. Indeed, it still holds the name of the Palace of Knossos. Can we even call it a palace? I'll ask that question again towards the end. Um, but he, he sees it as a royal residence and the inhabitants of this royal palace must be a royal family with a king at the head and a queen who is subservient to him. And that must be the primary function of this complex. He would feel that because he's researched ancient Egypt, he's researched discoveries across the Mediterranean and he's coming out of this, uh, you know, this British colonial environment himself. So he's, superimposing what he knows onto this site. But of course, this was a hundred years ago and developments have, have continued to be made. But one thing he could not deny, and one thing he, he actually leaned into quite heavily um, over the course of his investigations at Knossos, was the powerful role played by women. And once he gave up looking for that iconic King Minus of legend, and once he had to accept that there probably wasn't a labyrinth with a Minotaur in it at Knossos, what did he find instead? He found multiple, multiple indisputable pieces of evidence to argue that women held primary positions of influence in terms of politics, in terms of society, and in terms of religion. And one of the turning points was this throne. He was delighted when he found, found this on the 13th day of digging, of excavating, in the throne room, which as you can see has been uh, reconstructed, imagined in this way with fragments of griffins that were found in location. But, but at first he thought this was the throne of a king, 
it became very clear, uh, partly I think once, once he must have sat on it, that this was designed, it's a, very, it's a delicate throne and studies have been done on the, the seat of it. And archeologists archeolog argue quite convincingly that this was designed for the body of a woman. Um, if that is the case, what is going on in the throne room? Is it some sort of, um, I suppose, uh, welcoming chamber for a royal family? A throne room, as we might imagine it in Versailles or in Hampton Court? Probably not. It would only accommodate about 30 people. It, seemed, it comes at the end of a corridor. It seems that this was possibly a site for um, religious ceremonies. There are these uh, plinths that run around the edges and the throne is in the center. So one hypothesis is that during uh, ceremonies to worship what I will come on to show you, which may be some sort of mother goddess deity at the heart of Cretan religion, or uh, Minoan religion, um, that perhaps a female priestess or a woman sat in this chair and represented, stood in for uh, a goddess. But of course, this is speculation. And I was quite pleased with myself watching back the documentary because at all points I, I say, you know, there is evidence, there are uh, facts, things that we can tell for, that are coming out of the ground that are in front of our eyes. But the archaeologists working on such enormous and um, imaginatively provocative sites as Knossos will fill in the gaps themselves. And I think we're probably still filling in the gaps ourselves. So everything I say, I present to you from evidence, but it is, of course, my own view um, shaped by those of contemporary academics who are working in this field. That said, the thing that surprised me when I was going back through my photos for tonight, which thank you, thank you for the opportunity of going back through the tens of thousands of photos that I collect on my phone and returning to, to, uh, to Crete. <laughs> it was a real kind of trip down memory lane. I found I had taken hundreds of pictures and I'm so pleased I did because I think even then I must have been formulating this lecture for you because I took lots of images of the wall frescoes and particularly of the women. Now, I even say on camera, what's so striking in the Heraclean Museum when you're walking through the Minoan galleries is how you're almost looking for representations of men and are instead inundated by representations of women. Now, where else, and I might put this forward in the Q&A, but where else in the world would you find that? It's almost never the case. And yet, the, it, again and again through my photos, I found I, I picked up fragments, um, sections that were just exclusively about women. One of my favorite is this large scale fresco that you can see here. Um, at first, you can see, of course, the women beautifully dressed in these pleated skirts, um, uh, breasts open, which we'll discuss again in a bit, but they're, they're moving, they seem to be either processing or singing or dancing, but the ones we can see that remain have their hands raised. And up above, you can see two trees with women sort of reclining on cushions and they're in conversation with each other. But what really struck me when I started looking was, yes, OK, you've got the standing women, you've got the seated women. Can you see going back first through the sort of wave of cream and then into the red? Every single one of those faces is a female face. It's woman upon woman upon woman upon woman. And there I've done a close up on one of the fragments, but you've got these um, sort of negative impression females with the long hair and the necklaces. And then the positive impression, which is, um, you know, you can see the, the outline, you can see the eyeliner, the hair, distinctive hairstyle, the necklace. And uh, there's a reconstruction over there again, but other fragments there, you can see women playing instruments, women stitching, weaving, not a man in sight which at the time struck me. Here's another example, another large scale example. Again, you can see the negative impression of the uh, heads. Both They seem to be kind of conversing as they, they, they face in and then they face away from one another. More reclining women. These are frescoes from around the complex. Um, and that's, that's a close up on, on the women beneath the trees. There's certainly some sort of association between women and trees that I'll come back to with the with a later example. I just wanted to show you the color, the detail. It's it's just, it, it really surprised me. And of course you knew I was going to show you this magnificent woman, La Parisienne. And I actually, that sticks in my throat when I say it, because of course it was the name given to her by Arthur Evans in the 1920s. 
because he felt that she could quite easily grace the, the front of 1920s uh, Paris Vogue. She looked, um, the aesthetic of her lipstick, her eyeliner, her, her pale, very, very pale whitened skin that she, you know, she's worked up with makeup, that that would have been quite at home on the front cover of a 1920s um, fashion magazine. And I think that really um, takes you into the world of what Arthur Evans was trying to do after he discovered Knossos. What he tried to do by marketing it and selling it back to the European public, he was, selling them an art deco version of the Minoan past and drawing people to him as a result. I mean, it, it, everybody who, anyone who's anyone visited Knossos during the 20s and 30s, it was the place to go. But looking at this apart from Arthur Evans's version of it as La Parisienne, what do we see? We see a woman who is clearly in an important position, um, shown in profile. Again, as I mentioned, she has clearly used makeup to whiten her skin, red lipstick, eye, coal eyeliner, and this elaborate hairstyle. But the key for me was this knot that you can see, it kind of goes up over her shoulders. She has this very formal gown underneath. And then this knot that sits at the back of the neck and kind of runs down. And when we see this represented elsewhere, it's been termed a sacral knot. So it's highly likely that this female is part of a frieze where she's playing the role of a priestess or somebody involved in the sacred activities of the Palace of Knossos. I will just pause for a moment and give again my caution, which is in the absence of texts and records relating to the Minoan civilization, we speculate. There is still the wonderful world of Linear A out there for some amazing discovery to be made and for us to be able to crack it like the Rosetta Stone. But until that happens, the culmination of archaeological and art historical evidence is all we have to base these assumptions upon. And so everything comes with a hefty dose of perhaps and maybe. But again, there are so many of these representations that I think we can begin to say that this woman is clearly um, in a position of authority. This sits exactly alongside her in the Heraklion Museum, but nobody tends to pay as much attention to this fragment. I've zoomed in on it on the left there. You can see it's almost exactly the same as Le Parisienne, and yet it's part of a frieze. This is a tentative reconstruction of what the frieze may have looked like, but you can see um, a seated female who may well be, uh, as I mentioned with the throne, in lieu of the goddess or in lieu of some sort of deity, or indeed is a high priestess, high member of the religious community, being served by another woman. And um, again, it's fragmentary, but the separate sections indicate it may have been this sort of procession-like frieze. So having looked at frescoes, having looked at painted images of women, I want to turn to this enigmatic little object. Now, I, when I saw it in the museum, it caught my eye. We weren't due to be filming with it. We weren't due to be looking at it, but I couldn't help but be captivated by this enormous lump of gold that is sat in a glass case. When I then dug further and I started to research this piece, it's known as the Ring of Minos. And well, everything I've been saying about Arthur Evans and the archeology span of the time, is exemplified by the history of this little ring. It was apparently discovered by a young boy who was digging in a field. Um, he took it back, showed it to his parents. The parents invited the village priest in who thought it was precious and thought Sir Arthur Evans should be shown it. And then the priest seems to take the ring off the family and begin negotiations for the ring with Arthur Evans directly for exorbitant amounts. He asks for ridiculous amounts of money to the family, technically, via him from Arthur Evans. And they enter into this sort of uh, underhand, I suppose, black market, black market exchange. Something happens, Arthur Evans manages to get a cast of it. He has a reconstruction made of it, which can still be seen, uh, I think, in the Ashmolean. But then the, the ring seems to vanish until it does eventually end up in the hands of the Greek authorities and in the museum at Heraklion. So just this one little object tells you so much about the nature of archeology span in the last hundred years and how it's changed, how it is developed. But I want to look at it for its symbolism. 
because um, it's a seal ring. So you can see this, is, the, the image on the right is the impression it would make if it was cast into clay or into wax. And what a picture, what an image. You've got these sort of two sort of stepped um, stone structures, which again call to mind um, Minoan architecture. One of which has this two pronged, uh, they're referred to as boar's tusk, uh, boar, um, the horns of, uh, sorry, bull's horns. And of course, at Knossos, there is a monumental version of these that was discovered. And then there are miniature versions, but you can see one set of bull's horns on the left, and then two on little pedestals on that ship that's just underneath. And across this are four figures that are easily discernible, and they are female. The one on the boat is shown with that characteristic pleated skirt. She is steering and navigating the boat. Then you can see one woman with her hands on top of the bull's horns. She is looking up towards another figure who hovers in the air. And then this leaning woman in the center seems to be pulling at the tree while the one on the other side is pulling the tree towards her there as well. And one explanation for these images is that they're different elements of the apotheosis, a sort of sacred transformation of a deity. Um, in this case, it seems to be a female deity. In the absence of any other evidence, that is as far as we can go. We cannot speculate much further than that. But it is interesting that this solid gold ring, one of I think you know one of the biggest pieces of solid gold uh, to be discovered in Crete. It most likely, for its scale, belonged to a male owner. Uh, it's argued that it was a man's ring, but the fact it is so exuberant in its representation of women, I think, is quite telling of Minoan art. And again, I should date this for you. Um, this ring is probably about 1600 um, BCE. And of course the high point of Knossos is about 1750 BC to about 1500. But of course Minoan civilization can be dated more than a millennium before that, making it Europe's earliest civilization. Hence why Arthur Evans had so much to, to gain from it. Of course, I wasn't going to do Minoan art and women without showing you these. These were the big pull for me to create. I wanted to see the snake goddesses and they did not disappoint. So they're made of faience. They're this sort of, um, it, it, now it looks highly shiny, the terracotta that's glazed, uh, but it would have probably had a greater degree of um, differentiation between the colors, the shades. But on both figures, you can see this distinctive fashion that's also reflected in the painting, this cinched in waist with a belt, the sort of pleated apron, then the skirt billowing down. Uh, the bodice has sleeves, but it's very deliberately cut so that the breasts are exposed and lifted. So like a corset. Um, and the big, the larger of the figures, has the snakes actually integrated, sort of writhing around the arms, going up both arms up to the head and the neck, and even wrapping around the headdress. The what what has been termed the priestess, the slightly smaller figure, has two serpents, one in either hand, and this panther, this cat on the top as well. When they were just, when Arthur Evans discovered them, he thought they were special. He could tell from their context. You've also got these um, moonstone uh, pieces, fragments that are displayed above them in the museum that were found uh, in close proximity. So, is this some sort of uh, temple space? Is this some sort of ritual space? Are these icons? Are these representations of deities? Impossible to know, but. Um, just the presence of the snakes and the way that the snakes are interacting with the female body does suggest a layer of symbolism here because snakes, I don't have to tell you this, you will know, snakes carry many, many layers of symbolism, uh, not least because they shed their skin. And through that, they've often been interpreted both in the classical tradition up into the medieval as 
sort of resurrecting themselves, being reincarnated as they remove their old skin. So is this chthonic? Is it saying that these are goddesses of life, of regeneration? The emphasis on the breasts, is that an indicator of a fertility deity? The cat on the top has been interpreted as showing this woman has power over the natural world. We can speculate. But what they show me are these incredibly powerful women. The facial expressions, the stance, the dress, the absolutely um, openly exposed breasts. This is a representation of femininity that just is not there in other ancient civilizations, even in more recent modern civilizations. So to me, they are powerful and important pieces. And they're, they're not alone. Arthur Evans found a number of these sorts of uh, fragments of these sorts of sculptures and other bits of sculpture that may have been for more large scale images of women. So, for example, this headdress that would have gone on to a, fe a, a female sculpture. When we do find men, and I did want to include this because I think it's only fair, I was able to find one cabinet that had extensive representations of men. And in these cases, you can see the men, they are dressed in, uh, sorry, this is this is in the fresco um, gallery, I should mention. When you are looking elsewhere in Minoan art, of course, there are numerous representations of men, usually in the act of, like I said, boxing, sports, or that famous uh, Minoan activity of bull leaping. And in those cases, they're always shown with red skin, as opposed to the women who have white skin. And they are shown just with a, um, just a wrap around their loins, nothing else. So these, these three in this example are in part of a procession, it seems, carrying um, vessels and they are distinctly male because of their color and their dress. But if you look, I've done a blow up of the frieze below. This is a frieze that shows men in exactly the same representation with, in this case, carrying um, different pots again, but it is, in this frieze, women that are at the center of the activity. So it is the women at the beginning of the procession, the women at the center of the procession, and the women in front at the end of the procession. So the men are in attendance. Again, this is just unique. And I thought it was so unusual that I photographed it at the time. And when I returned to it, I wanted to share it with you. But I have not got long. I already am aware I'm overrunning, so I'm gonna whiz through this last bit. But why did I fall in love with Manoan art? Well, just look at these examples. It's not just, the stunning uh, women that are represented in it that I, that I fell for, it's also their take on the natural world. While you look over to Messina, to what will then happen in, in Greek and later Roman art, which as I mentioned is quite um, homocentric, it's focused on, on the human form. Theirs is an art that revels in the natural world. Look, at that, uh, at the tentacles on that octopus. And I had a go at making a Minoan vase. It was incredibly hard. And the hardest part was painting because you have to move with such fluidity, such speed in order to make these fluid strokes that it, it takes a lifetime to master. And the one that really got me was the reed bed. Because again, where have you seen anything as beautiful as that? It's as you, they've used the shape of the jar to, of the jug to show the way that reeds move in the wind. But then it goes right down to small scale. This is, a, there's, there's a number of pieces uh, in the museum that are obsessed with architecture, little mini houses, um, map, you know, representations of palace complex. And here you've got three columns, but look what's on the top, three nesting doves. I'm always drawn to the natural world. It extends across their artworks. So some of my favorite pieces are here. You've got um, a freeze up there of a cat pounce, waiting to pounce on a bird. Look at the tension and, and the, you know, every hair has been captured in that cat. You've got the freeze of the partridges, which again, I think is, is so beautiful. It shows such an attention to detail. Um, on the, the small um, seal dies, I've, I've shown you just a selection here. There are cabinets of them. I adore them because just the use of the, of the precious jewel is, is sublime. But you'll see across this fish, leaves, uh, there's a ship up there, which we'll come back to, but uh, just these, these very kind of detail, um, delicate representations of the natural world. And then these two that I love, the bull, Again, very, very important at Knossos and the lion and both of these designed as jugs to pour out wine. So you would put the wine into the boar's head and it would pour out the nose. And similarly, 
with the lion. It's designed to, to be shared during a feast. So it just gives me the sense of a world that was full of pleasure. I really want to leave time for Q&A, but I wanted to just show you how developments in the field have changed. So I want to show you a Minoan world which revels in nature, revels in art, um, celebrates the beautiful and has a court at which women are in the very heart. But Arthur Evans gave us some of those things. It's now been up to generations later of further archeologists to find everyone else. And by that, I mean all the other people that haven't been recorded. Arthur Evans was looking for kings, queens, nobles, priests, priestesses, all the upper echelons of society. But this map show, uh, that he actually was responsible for shows the extent of the city of Knossos. It was not just the palace. The complex spread right out to a wall and then further still. There were tens of thousands of inhabitants in this uh, location. And how do we get to them? Well, let's have a look and see. Um, I want to show you this little clip because I think it might help to visualize where we might go next. The school now analyzes thousands of finds from Arthur's decades of digging. Actually, this comes from the excavations of Sarah Evans in the palace, and it's a masterpiece. And you can realize it from the quality of clay, from the firing, from the way the painter took his brush, his or her brush. Uh -huh. We don't know. <laughs> and uh, make these beautiful uh, decorative uh, elements. Very few Minoans were rich enough to own things like this. But he was selective with his material, wasn't he? It was highly selective mm. because during that period, they used to keep only nice stuff. Arthur's focus was always on the elite. Now, Costas is using the finds he discarded to reveal the lives of ordinary Minoans. Conical gaps like this one, simple undecorated conical caps, massively produced, were overlooked, yeah. mostly used by the ordinary people, by the poor people. These are the things they're using every day. These are the cups they're drinking the exactly. liquid in. They use and then they throw. You know, the conical caps for, for the Minoans were like our plastic or party cups. And also you can see here the fingers of the potter. So let's say that holding this cup, it's like to have a intimate contact with the person who made it or the person who used it. Oh, I love that. The fingerprint there, it's it's almost like by touching that, you're, you're sort of holding hands with someone from the past. I mean, for me, you've got the sense that Arthur Evans is sort of the foundation, and then all these other archaeologists are building onto that and creating a bigger picture. Right. Sorry, I wanted to share just that clip with you because I think it gives us an insight into um, what's coming next in the story of um, Minoan archaeology. And I think what we're really getting a sense of now is what Knossos was on a larger scale. It's not the palace of King Minos and the labyrinth and the Minotaur. It is not the palace of a king, a queen, a royal family. I think it was an administrative center. What you get here are storage units, libraries, administration offices. You've got um, a temple for sun worship. And in misunderstanding how this space was articulated through Arthur Evans's reconstructions, we've ended up seeing it as something that it's not. But it, uh, for me, it was the heart of a um, um, amazing civilization that wasn't, that wasn't warlike. It was trading across these huge networks over to Egypt, over to, uh, to, to the to Middle East and over into Europe. And yet they managed to survive for thousands of years with this different sort of civilization that grew up, its own language, its own way of writing, its own way of conducting itself. And that for me is the real insight into Knossos. Thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry I slightly overran. Now I'm hoping, ah, you're back. <laughs> <And that's well. laughs> Thank you so much, Nina. Um, I think you've 
done that brilliantly in order to leave us a little bit of time for questions. So I can see that some have come in already. Um, I've had some sent to me too. So I think let's just start um, on some of these questions because I can see there's some fantastic ones. Excellent. So we'll start with one that came in earlier from Susan, which said, why do we still tend to assume that women's power is in the realm of religion rather than politics to the extent that the two might be different in ancient civilizations? Well, hopefully, if I'd have had longer, I'd have gone into more detail about the political uh, coming out of the religious. But as I mentioned right at the end there, I think what we've got at Knossos is a combi combined functional uh, functional space. So today we might, I suppose, associate it with the way that the Houses of Parliament and the Bishop's Palace across the river and Westminster Abbey are all sort of the center of, of decision making. And I feel that very strongly at Knossos. And I feel that the fact that women have representation across the space in all sorts of different contexts means they're not simply confined to the realm of religion, but it's in the realm of religion we see the more symbolic rendering of clearly the snakes, um, the sort of dominance over nature, the processional routes where the women are the ones enthroned. But I think that spills over very much into the administrative um, and the bureaucratic and the political. And I feel that um, that space, it would be very strange if you left the sort of temple area of Knossos, walked into the admin centre and there were two completely different worldviews because the same artwork appears in the administrative space as well with representations of women. So while we have no documentary evidence that we can use to back that up, I would largely see it as, as, as being... A, a bigger picture not just their their position within the religious realm yeah thank you and you mentioned snakes there which leads me on to another question from samantha which was can you just give us an idea of the scale of the snake goddesses and and how and how big they are as well compared to obviously we saw previously the huge vases excellent excellent question well um they're they're relatively small i mean the, some of the frescoes you saw there like the king of the lilies he's life-size he's huge and there are reliefs of women oh gosh i should have included that slide there's this stunning one of a seated woman she's on a, a cushion and she's got uh, you can see her buttocks and her thighs and her her, her arms and her chest in relief and she's larger than life-size but these are not these are um possibly the height of a shoebox. They're not huge, but they're bigger than some of the other, what, what might be totemic pieces. There's a parallel um, that I looked at at the end of the, the program, which was a later piece, which shows a military god, a representation of Zeus in his youthful military form, which is about the same scale. And that was definitely used as a, um, an icon within a religious setting, which is, I think, why Arthur Evans was able to say, you know, if they're bigger, than the others that survive from the site but they are probably serving a similar function and they are probably uh, religious images but a very good question scale is always so important <laughs> with these things and that's a brilliant uh, historical question <laughs> well done Samantha um, yeah. <laughs> I know you mentioned how much that you you know you always seek to find out elements of the natural world when you're looking at archaeology Tracy's asked do we know what the significance of the octopus is in Minoan art? Oh, what a great question, Tracy. Well, actually, again, this struck me. Um, you can see hierarchies in the representations of nature in, I think, in Minoan art. I think you can see the large beasts, uh, the bull being absolutely paramount among, amongst those, and it, its fearsomeness um, being so central to, I think, rituals um, and, and things that took place at Knossos. I'm married to a man from Andalusia and bull, bulls and bullfighting go right the way back through that region. And I see a similar respect and honour and fear of the bull in, in the artwork that survives of bull leaping and, and, and representations of the bull. Then you have the lion, and these wouldn't have been now enormous lions, these would have been a slightly a smaller version, but, but I love the representation of that lion in limestone, so carefully picked out with the, with the fur and, the, and whiskers. Um, they're the sort of large mammals that we see. Then there's a lot of birds, and ground-dwelling birds water birds, ducks, um, and you know, all sorts of different exotic birds. But when it comes to the oceanic creatures, I think Minoan art shows them more than any other um, collection of art that I know of. And it is all sorts of things. Um, fish, obviously, but different types of shells, different type of mollusks, um, and you know the, these argonauts, these octopi, these things that inhabit the sea. And of course, I mean, think about Crete, it is this long skinny island surrounded by the Mediterranean on all sides. And 
one of the things we know for a fact was that the Minoans were making their wealth and, and keeping their prosperity through trade over the sea on boats. Um, you find these wonderful clay figurines of, of Minoan boats. So they are out in the sea, they are living from the sea, and they are looking at the sea. They are looking carefully at the creatures in it. And that's one of the things you see when you, when you look at the octopus in particular, the incredible attention to detail. It's been done from life without a doubt. Um, so that, for me, gives an insight into their understanding of nature. It's not a fantastical, um, abstracted version of nature. There's not, you've got the griffin, of course, but on the whole, they're not fantastic beasts. They're not imagined hybrids. They are real things that they encountered. And there's a honesty to the object, to the art, to the creature in their representation of them that I think is quite unique. Um, and it took my breath away when I saw the, the octopus. Bus. It's not just that, it's the way it rides across the, the, the object. The three dimensional, three-dimensional nature of the, the vase and the way that they've made the tentacles move around it I think it's just Incredible. inspiring oh just chick you know goosebump stuff absolutely <laughs> beautiful one thing that's really striking from so many of the frescoes that you showed is the deep blue and red colors someone else has asked you know is that a res the fact that they've used those two colors as a result of the sort of pigments or clays that were available on the island were there other choices available to them yeah, uh, I think it's a combination of both. I think that there's a taste for it. Um, and I think what you can see is certain colours being used in certain environments to indicate, say, sacred spaces. Um, you know, you, you, the throne room appears to have been this deep ochre red, which m gives it that sort of sacredness, I suppose, that we still even see reflected in medieval cathedrals and in, in throne rooms today. But you're right, a lot of it comes down to access to materials. And um, the, the reds would, like I say, come from a sort of ochre and the clay on uh, Crete as well could be come in different colors. So the black, for example, can be worked up from the clay or it can be worked up from coal, from um, you know, burnt wood, which again would have been used for, for eyeliner. Um, and there would have been limits to what they could have done. This is the Bronze Age. So they could potentially start to be thinking about greens that they could be mixing up from oxides. But on the whole, they'll be limited to, to what they can get from natural rocks and stones, which will be a palette of, of mainly uh, sort of blues and reds and yellows, um, creams, black, brown, um, maybe a bit of purple. And that, that, would be, that would be the extent of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is a really big question, so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, I'll give you some, it's something we have a short answer. Um, but when we see that all the different types of art that you've shown from the Minoan age and compare that to the classical age, obviously, you know, there are so many, so many striking differences and particularly in the representation of women. Um, can you give us a sense of how I suppose Crete's position as an island meant that it was connected or disconnected from other artists and, and a little bit of, of that, how it tra that transitionary period? Trina, I'm so glad you asked me that, because if I'd have had three more minutes at the end of my lecture, that was exactly what I was going to summarise. <laughs> Hence my last slide, which showed, you know, the palace, the map. Um, I think what is so unique about Minoan civilization, and I learned this from being in Chatelhoyak and looking at Turkey and looking at the sort of Anatolian influence on the emergence of cities uh, from, you know, 10,000 BC across. We have a... Um, a curated view of how cities evolved across time that has been dictated by big discoveries like Troy, like Knossos, like you know, Greek discoveries, like ancient Egypt. But there was an awful lot of fluidity and exchange and an awful lot that's been lost that we will never get access to and be able to reconstruct. And I think what you've got happening in Crete is a population that have been on that island for 10,000 years who over the, the millennia have um, developed their approach to building, which works with the landscape, works with the, the stones and the things that they have around. And then as they've developed their seafaring te um, technology, as they're able to travel, they encounter Egypt, they encounter Greece, they encounter Anatolia, they encounter Jerusalem and the Middle East. And through each of these encounters, what they take back and what they send out influences, but it ultimately comes back to an island that I think was quite closed. And, oh, dare I go there? I was thinking in the car earlier, am I gonna make this claim? I am gonna make this claim. <laughs> One of the things 
don't have the records for from Crete is military activity. And so one of the assumptions you get in every book about the Minoans is that they didn't engage in war. They were a peacekeeping people. And what we found in the later investigations, why the Minoans fell and why they were ultimately replaced by the Mycenaeans was that there was this tsunami, the tsunami created devastation. In the wake of the devastation, they became vulnerable and then they were in, they were attacked from Greece and they became victims. Um, now I, I would like to say, I think that they don't seem a particularly military race in the run up to that experience. They seem to militarize quite quickly in response to threats. Um, and we cannot argue on the basis of no evidence that there wasn't an organized army and that they weren't engaging in warfare, but they seem to be far more engaged in trade. Um, and their interactions with others uh, seem to be on that level. Whether that is because of administrative places like Knossos with a heavy female presence, creating this, these sorts of bedrocks of knowledge, libraries of, of you know, pithoi that are trading across the, the Mediterranean or, or what, uh, but there does, let, there does seem to be less of a military endeavor going on amongst the Minoans. And I think that feeds into their art. I think that feeds into the, the, what we see of their religion, what we see of their society, but it is such a fragmentary picture. It is so easy to superimpose our own assumptions on it mm. and dangerous to do so. But I think that that might be an answer to your question. And we have seen other scholars and archaeologists do just that. So as you say, it's unraveling that extra layer as well of interpretation of, of, of scarce remains. What we do, exactly how we impose our own bias and our own agendas upon this evidence, exactly. Which, of course, I've been doing, but <laughs> doing it with the caveat that it is my interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that leads us nicely on to, I think, what might have to be our final question, which is from Eva, age 10, who, oh, yeah. has, who has said, um, I suppose linked to what, to what you've just said there, but why do you think that this island in particular is a place in the ancient world where women appear to have been so much more important, not, you know, beyond the art, than mm. in so many other places in the ancient world? Yeah, Eva, your question is fantastic. Um, find Crete on a map, go and have a look for it. It's this long skinny thing and its location is impossibly fortuitous. It is so uh, well connected in terms of if you could get on a boat and make those journeys, you can get to all these different cultures and civilizations. And yet it is safe and secure in many respects. It's not connected by land to other of the great warring nations. It's not sharing borders or boundaries. And there isn't that sort of crash that you get on mainland, large, large mainland territories between different rival factions. So I think that that is partly what gave um, the Minoans a chance to develop their own unique take uh, on civilization. And in that, women found their found a place that was um, unusual, unusual and not found elsewhere. So I would put a lot of it down to its geography. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. I'm sorry we've not had a chance to get to all of them. There's just so many. Um, oh, I would say if, if there are any left over, Katrina, and you want to send them to me, I'll try and reply to them by email. So if people want to get a reply, I'd be happy to help. That's or you can send them to me on Twitter. I don't know if you're on Twitter, but I'm <laughs> at Dr. Nina Ramirez on Twitter. I'm happy to answer your questions on there as well. That's very kind. Thank you. Yeah. So do send do send me any questions you have and I can send them on to, to Nina. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Nina, for such a brilliant lecture. I mean, you speak with such eloquence and panache always. And so it's always a pleasure to, to listen to you, but especially to have what feels like, you know, this personal kind of connection across across Zoom. Um, to learn the word Disneyfication, I think that's a fantastic <laughs> verb. Great word, isn't it? I can't stop using it now. <laughs> I'm going to slip that into conversation now where, wherever possible yeah <laughs> and it's just so helpful I think to get a clear view of of a place that we find so fascinating and yet it is still there's always this kind of uncertainty between what's real what's fabricated what what isn't and obviously that's that's what's so interesting that we're still guessing and we're still discovering new things as you showed but thank you so much yes for just bringing these stories to life and I, I think you know for all of your work more generally which it's really nice to have the opportunity to say thank you for everything that you do to bring the past 
not only to life but to all of us as well and oh make that's the loveliest thing thank you Katrina what a lovely thing to say and um yeah I'm I, I hope there will be a lot more of it this year it's an exciting year two books big series lots of things happening and um I just yeah I hope I can keep doing what I do I love it and you managed to ask me the perfect thing tonight to talk about Knossos with you for an hour has been such a pleasure it's taken me back and it's just made me so happy so thank you Oh, well, that's so lovely. <laughs> so thank you all for tuning in. Yeah, thank yeah. you to everyone that came. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you again in person on the 3rd of March at AKS, if you can make it, or online as usual. Um, and we have our book club, as I mentioned before. We also then have on the 26th of March, the grand final of our student classics competition. So students, I hope your presentations are going well if you're preparing for the competition. And everybody else, I hope you're able to make it on Saturday so that we can watch our four finalists deliver their presentations, which as we know, are always fantastic. So thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you once again to our speaker, Dr. Ramirez. Take care and we'll see you again soon.